All right, we are recording. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, all you attendees um, out there in the ether. Uh, we are um, delighted to have you here for this year's case conference. Uh, this panel on black space making in nature, music, and migration, I'm really excited about. We have uh, three local scholars, uh, Tashari White, Dr. Hewan Girma, and Dr. David Ahrens, who are each going to be speaking for approximately 15 minutes. Um, after that time, I imagine there'll be a little exchange between the, uh, the three of them, and then we can open up the floor uh, uh, to the community at large for some questions. Please post your questions in the chat, and I will bring them to, um, to the guests, um, to our speakers. So to start us off, uh, Tashari White is a PhD candidate in geography, environment, and sustainability. Welcome to Shari. Hi, thank you. So I'll get my presentation pulled up for you. Um, if you could let me know if you can see it because I can't see you guys. Uh, we can not oh? see it. Okay, hold on. I know I just did this, okay. Here we go. There we go. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay, so the title of my presentation today is The South is a Sick Place. So in this presentation, I will discuss how, in retrospect, racial violence against Black Americans in the American South has impacted their contemporary participation in nature exploration. I will also explain what a sick place is and how the South has met that criteria uh, for Black people, generally speaking, but more specifically in environmental and geographical context. So although racism can be experienced anywhere in the world, it's no secret that the American South has historically been a space colluded with racism, discrimination, and xenophobia. Additionally, while systematic racism is experienced in every sector of society, my research focuses primarily on environmental racism experience in, um, experienced by Black Americans that have excluded them and discouraged them from participating in environmental related activities from a policy decision making to outdoor recreation. The environmental movement has been whitewashed um, and has severed the relationship between Black Americans and nature. So in comparison to northern states, the South can be described as less indu industrial and more forest like and although 56% of Black people live in the South, where it's an abundance of trees and green spaces, there are not many reports of Black Americans seen at national or state parks or interested in outdoor activities in general. Black Americans are also three times less likely to have access to these green spaces, and they're 1.5 uh, times more likely to bear the burden of environmental pollution due to environmental racism. So there's a lack of diversity amongst environmental organizations and companies and even institutions. Uh, for instance, approximately 80% of national park staff is white while less than 2% of its visitors are black. Fostering a relationship with nature is important for the resiliency and survivability of black communities across the nation. So I'm thinking about the issue of the lack of diversity in environmental and geography fields. I've done some thinking of how racism plays a part in all of this and how the lack of participation from black people may have larger implications for our com communities in uh, relation to climate change. So what defines a sick place? So simply, a sick place is where a traumatic event occurs. For instance, when we think of the 9-11 incident in New York City um, and how on that day every year people gather in that space to mourn their loved ones who passed, um, that would be considered a sick place in geography. So for Black Americans, a sick place may just be the generalized South. So Dr. Joy DeGroy, she explains that modern day black and white Americans may be experiencing post-traumatic slave syndrome, 
And she describes this as a symptom of slavery in which both black and white people are traumatized in different ways. She argues that enslaved Africans suffered from post-traumatic slave disorder, and that has been passed down epigenetically from generation to generation, which has developed into this post-traumatic slave syndrome, which is PTSS. So she poses the question of what symptoms of trauma does one exhibit after a lifetime of slavery? Additionally, she makes the point that there were no mental health counseling centers set up for free slaves. So their traumas were never really addressed and never ceased to exist. So my question is, if Black Americans did inherit trauma from their ancestors, how has this trauma impacted their relationship with nature? So in order to answer that question, I figured I would have to evaluate some moments in time. Um, so we will go through the slave trade, the Civil War, and the Jim Crow era. I've divided this into three time periods. Um, it's going to be nearly impossible for me to cover several hundreds of years um, in, <laughs> in like 15 minutes. So um, this is in no way comprehensive, but uh, just a, a glimpse of some time periods that may be of importance. So the enslavement of African people has had many effects on our contemporary society, but it also has had effects on how Black Americans today experience nature. During slavery, the woods were either seen as a sanction or a sanctuary. During this time, uh, Africans were forced to do manual labor in harsh conditions, uh, when they tried to escape, they were beaten for little reason. Um, and these inhumane acts of brutality uh, created a strain on the relationship with the land. However, nature was not always a scary place for African-Americans during this time. When enslaved Africans did escape successfully from their suppressors and they fled to the woods or to the mountains or to swamps even, um, as you can see in the far right picture, uh, that's a picture of the Great Dismal Swamp, or painting, I should say. Um, so enslaved Africans use their natural resources around them to survive and to birth generations that would never experience slavery. However, not were all so brave to escape, not all were so successful. Some Africans were sold into slavery, some were born into slavery, many died while still enslaved, which leads me to my next point. So I was solicited to work on a project alongside photographer and author Lori Lyons, now turned activist. In Savannah, Georgia, there is a burial ground of enslaved Africans that has been redesigned as green squares. There's never been any rightful acknowledgement of these enslaved people until now. However, as we've seen in many cases, racist slave owners are immortalized, which you can see the squares were named after George Whitefield and John C. Calhoun, which were both slave owners and they both advocated for the legalization of slavery. So Lyons has been working with the local government to right this wrong. She's taken matters into her own hands and she's created a petition to change the names of the squares to honor these enslaved Africans who have not been acknowledged in these green spaces. So I wanted to just use this as an opportunity to point out how this relates to the constant erasure of Black history and Black people in green spaces in the South. So we're gonna fast forward a little bit to the Civil War. The significance of this time period is more so about its lasting effects. As you can see from the map to your left, the South succeeded during this time. Now, one myth is that it had nothing to do with slavery, but historians would disagree. It's been documented that the Southern states, they felt like their rights and their liberties were infringed upon when the North disapproved of slavery. So imagine that some of the states with the most agriculture, the most land, the most green spaces and overall nature are the states that wanted to continue the oppression of Black people. They literally went to war to enslave African-Americans. Um, now you may be wondering what this picture of Harriet Tubman is doing here. During the Civil War, Harriet was known as Moses um, for leading her people to freedom. She was an abolitionist prior to the war, but during the war, she was also a spy. Um, she also led a military assault during this time. So Harriet was definitely a pioneer, but what 
some people don't acknowledge about Harriet was that she was a wilderness explorer. When you think about Harriet, you should think about how she memorized her environment in a hundred mile radius. She knew where to hide. She knew where to forage for food. She knew how to survive in wilderness. And she definitely deserves her flowers as a wilderness explorer. Telling these narratives are also important for creating a black sense of space and place when it comes to environmentalism and geography. So we're gonna jump around a bit again um, to the current day actually, and talk about mapping southernness. Um, this map was created by UNC, Green, UNC Green, Greensboro's Dr. Rick Bunch in the geography department. This map um, of southernness shows all different types of things, but one thing it shows in particular is the concentration of Black Americans in the South. And it also shows the concentration of Confederate symbols in the South. Now, Confederate symbols and Black Americans, if we were to put these maps together or, or combine them, there would probably be an overlap, right? Um, and I bring this up because I wanted to point out that Confederate symbols are a reminder of the slavery and oppression and racial violence that Black Americans have experienced. And a lot of them are located in green spaces and state parks and national parks throughout the country. And they serve as a reminder or a flagpole, for instance, like this is a white space. The South is a white space. Um, these these uh, memorabilia are located in public spaces that evoke feelings that are negative to ward off people, to ward off Black people in particular. During the Civil War, Black Americans in the South were promised 40 acres of land and a mule. Of course, it does not happen, as we know, uh, but I wanted to say that the actual order was to promise 400 thousand acres of land from Charleston, South Carolina to St. John's River in Florida, which would include Georgia's Sea Islands and the mainland, which is like 30 miles in from the coast. So this would have been redistributed to newly free slaves. Uh, so essentially Black people were supposed to have their own states to govern their own land, but that did not happen. We didn't get anything. Um, and owning land is an asset no matter where you are in the world. And here the government made it very hard for Black people to accumulate that sense of wealth or empowerment. So we can reflect on how that's impacted our relationship with the land as well by not being able to own any. So we finally made it to the Jim Crow era. Does it get any better? Absolutely not. <laughs> Black Americans were prohibited from visiting certain parks and parks that did allow Black Americans had specific designations for colored people. And these designated areas were of course of poor quality, lacking bathhouses and proper uh, water fountains and so on and so forth. So during the Jim Crow era, of course, um, lynching took place during this time. Artist Ken Gonzalez Day, um, these are his photographs. Uh, he removed the victims of lynching to bring more attention to those that committed the lynchings and also relatively where these lynchings occurred, which were in, you know, usually densely wooded areas um, where there were a lot of trees uh, and essentially in nature. So then again, you have this theme of these spaces not really being for Black people or welcoming to Black people. So I wanted to show you all a map actually of lynching in the South. Here we can see, of course, this clustering again of this, this uh, inhumane act of, of lynching. And in North Carolina, 120 reported lynchings. If you click on it, it's interactive and you can see by county um, where or how many lynchings occurred. There's also another map that is a bit more detailed that I like to use uh, to show how the South is just a sick place geographically. And all of the lynchings that occurred in the South are displayed here as well on this map, but you can actually click on a point and it'll show you more details about the person that was lynched.
So in, in terms of other acts of racial violence against Black Americans that were committed in the South, um, Black children were used as alligator bait. Uh, during this time, they were tied to logs and set in the swamp to lure alligators. There's articles in the news. Um, this is a real thing that did happen. So when we think about venturing out into wilderness spaces and all of the crimes that were committed against Black people and all of the harms committed against Black people during this time and in, in, in these places in nature, um, it, it's definitely traumatizing and goes back to that PTSS that Dr. Joy DeGore talks about. Again, I just wanted to point out the land issue and the denial of land and property ownership during Jim Crow. Black people were denied certain um, housing, which also could be linked to environmental pollution of Black neighborhoods today um, and how waste facilities and, and land uh, landfills and things like that are all located in these areas that were deemed as uh, poor quality because Black people live there. So despite these setbacks, Black people did find the determination to explore the world around them. The Negro Traveler's Guide, also known as the Green Book, was a catalog of all the places where safe that were safe and welcoming for Black Americans. It's kind of like a Yelp for Black people. Traveling through the South was dangerous for us, and it's still dangerous today. Uh, There's still sundown towns. Um, all these things are still conscious or in the consciousness of, of Black people, uh, contemporary Black Americans, I should say. Black Americans also sought freedom from Jim Crow by moving North during the Great Migration. However, Many Black people stayed behind, which is why we see that high concentration of them on the map in, in the South, and 56% of Black people live in the South. And it's still happening today. These acts of violence are still happening in wilderness spaces. Um, in 2020, I believe, the Great Smoky Mountains, um, there was a news article where someone skinned a bear and threw it on top of um, the welcome sign and said, Black lives don't matter. We had the Amy Cooper and Christian Cooper, no relation, some relation um, uh, incident in New York. Um, there was another incident where a Black man, um, you can't really see him, but he's right here, where it was like a modern day lynching in broad daylight where they tried to hang him to a tree. So, Black space making in the South historically has been difficult to say the least. Black space making in green spaces has been maybe even more difficult. Um, we've either been excluded from these spaces or abused in these spaces. However, as I mentioned before, reconnecting with nature is imperative for our integrity as a people. We've expanded our horizons and defy the odds in various aspects of society except for nature. But it's time to shift the narrative and, and address these issues and address the racial violence that has occurred and make actual tangible efforts to, to change these instances from and stop them from happening. And that's all I have. Thank you so much, Tashari. Um, I am filled with questions and comments, <laughs> but I am going to uh, hold hold them back for a, a little bit. We're gonna get through everybody and then and then have our little discussion. So um, next up, uh, Dr. Haywan Girma. She is here as a uh, in the Department of African African American Diaspora Studies. So please welcome Dr. Girma. Okay, thank you for that introduction. And Tashari, thank you for that great presentation. And I also have a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> so um, we're going to shift a little bit from um, uh, space making and in, in, in nature and uh, nature spaces to migrant space making. Um, so what I'm going to pre be presenting today is uh, an excerpt of a book project that I'm working on looking at um, different forms of African migration, Ethiopian migration more specifically. I'm looking at um, Ethiopians who have returned back to their homeland after living in the diaspora 
for a period of five years or more. So I'm calling these returnees or return migrants, and I'm also looking at repeat migrants. So after they return back, then they decide to go um, you know, back to the US or Europe or wherever they were from. So looking at these movements of people in different places, and one of the arguments that I'm making is that uh, as these folks are moving from these different places, they are making a significant impact on the physical infrastructure. Um, and urban lands landscapes in particular. So I'll be presenting three different areas, three different spaces that um, are significant for Ethiopian migrants. The first one is uh, starts from the airports, um, you know, very uh, simple and straightforward. And then I'll be comparing the cities of Addis Ababa, which is the um, capital of Ethiopia, and Washington DC, which is a, a, a site for um, attracts, you know, um, major migrant destination for Ethiopians. Uh, in the past, you know, 40 years or so. So let me start with um, Bole. And uh, what you see here, with this image that you see here, is uh, the structure uh, that travelers would see as they go into the airport, go in and out of the airport. So on this, um, on the structure, uh, the way uh, the architecture from this is reminiscent of the fourth century Aksumite Empire. So it's alluding to Ethiopia's history. And then on the two sides of this empire, on the side you can see says and welcome. Um, and on the flip side, uh, which I don't have a picture of that, it says Melkam Guzo or Bon Voyage, right? So this is the kind of like the, the first entry that um, travelers would see as they enter or leave um, the airport. So this is a very understated um, architecture at the beginning of the airport, but it signals uh, Ethiopia's incorporation into the global sphere, right? This is an older picture, uh, but it incorporates um, how Ethiopia is part of this global sphere. So Bole Airport, which is where this is located, is the largest hub in Africa that accommodates about 22 million passengers a year. This is as of 2019, so pre-pandemic, right? Um, so comparing this 22 million to about 60 million annual passengers uh, at JFK and about 80 million passengers at uh, London Heathrow. So very, very significant uh, player within this area. So the current site of the airport was established in 1945. Uh, so it has a long history. And let's be honest, there's little that is romantic about airports, right? They're very uncomfortable spaces of containment. They are septic petri dishes, uh, excruciating security checkpoints, uh, missed connections, long layovers, etc. But there are also places of possibilities and faraway destinations. They represent a microcosm of civilization brimming with diversity. So a social scientist can look at the space and can identify a lot of the different ways that migrants come into the space and uh, make an impact on the space and how the space makes an impact on them. So we can position Boli Airport as a defi defining feature of Ethiopian migration. With an estimated one to two million Ethiopians living outside of the country, the revolving doors of Boli Airport are as signifiers of the changes and intensification that are shaping Ethiopian migration. This might be a mundane place for some, uh, and inaccessible for others. It definitely excludes a significant portion of the Ethiopian population who will never see beyond this particular site. So it becomes a place of aspiration as well, right? Um, the other thing, the exit through Bole Airport is um, hides behind it a more insidious form of exit, that of migration, of irregular migration. So as an exit strategy, Bole, uh, the airport is often contrasted with Bale, a region in the south of Ethiopia where migrants, where Ethiopian migrants historically crossed to seek refuge in the neighboring country of, of Kenya. So the difference between Bole and Bale, uh, only one syllable apart, marks the different strategy, exit strategies of migrants, exit by air, exit by foot, exit through regular migration, regulated versus the unregulated. So Bole symbolizes the legality while uh, Bale is undocumented migration. So my personal recollections of Bole um, are, you know, memories of departure and return, of separation and reunion, loss, belonging, gain, and all of this combined at the same time. And despite the many times that I've crossed these arches, they still remain a significant site, um, significant symbol for, um, for me as a migrant. 
So this is the entry point, right? Like imagine a returnee coming into the country. This would be the first thing that they see. And then uh, the capital city is the place that welcomes them. So Addis Ababa, the city, the capital city of Ethiopia, is a settlement that began in 1886 with a few hundred people and is now the biggest and most diverse urban center in East Africa. There's an estimated population of about 5 million. These numbers are highly contested uh, because there's an undercounting in terms of the census. Locals always affectionately call it Addis, never employing its full name. It's an enthralling city, uh, a constant metamorphosis that is hard to categorize. Um, Addis Ababa does not constitute a cohesive urban space, but it is rather made up of a series of social, spatial, and cultural fragments that are interconnected. It is hard to describe the city where so much contradiction resides. So on one side, the regional power of this African political Medina is undeniable, both in terms of economic strength and political symbolism. It is the seat of the African Union, as well as the African headquarters of the United Nation, and as such attracts a multitude of nationalities and embassies. It forms an alphabet jungle, and deciphering the many acronyms, uh, WB, World Bank, IMF, AU, UN, UNECA, becomes a daily challenge for the uninitiated. Most of the major streets in Addis are named after African countries, perhaps to emphasize the importance of the African politics for the symbolic identity of this city. So the unpredictability of Addis, of life in Addis, is both energizing, you never know what to expect, as well as terrifying, you never know what to expect. So every day can be a surprise as life is lived on the edge. Um, so forget the sanitized, clockwork, predictable lifestyle of North America or Europe. The hustle and bustle of Addis is undeniable, and you have to grapple with it. So the pace of Addis is invigorating and exhausting at the same time. Um, and this is a space that is visibly affected by the presence of the diaspora. So migration has seeped into every aspect of Ethiopian life and none can escape the penetration of migration. Um, walking down the street, one is constantly reminded of the weight of the diaspora and the homeland as the effects of migration is visible in every aspect of the uh, political and sociocultural life of the city. So these are a couple of pictures of different businesses that have been started by uh, returnees, so Ethiopian migrants that have lived outside of Ethiopia and have come back. So as you can see, you have one that says La Parisienne, which is a reference to the um, Paris, to the French city. You have Washington Hotel. Uh, you have German beer garden. The sign only shows the beer garden in aspect. And then you have O Canada Cafe. And as you can see underneath the O Canada says, remember the, the sweet times, right? So these are businesses that were started by folks that live outside of, the, uh, of Ethiopia and have come back and have opened up these businesses with names reminiscent of the places that they came from. So these names that were called the global geographies and faraway destinations testify to the presence of returnees and the importance of the diaspora. Um, sometimes the names may be aspirational, names like New York Bistro, Amsterdam Cafe, and Oslo Cafe. So if you see on this next picture, uh, Boston Day Spa is like one of the most well-known uh, destinations in Addis, uh, where the owner, who is a returnee from Boston, no surprise there, um, has opened a series of places, hospitality um, places, including like spas and hotels and resorts, etc. And this name has become very recognizable. And Oslo Cafe is another one of those. So these names uh, can be aspirational as, as well. The names of places that non-migrants dream or harbor um, of going to. What is missing um, in the city of Addis is uh, the destinations that the irregular migrants go to, right? There is no such thing as a Joburg cafe. There's no Kakuma um, grocery store, Beirut stores, Riyadh uh, restaurants, etc. These are conspicuously missing. So places from the global south are not really represented in the uh, physical landscape in Addis Ababa. So one of the examples that I can give is um, Sana restaurant, but this is not something, a business that were opened by a returnee, was rather opened by Yemeni migrants that have settled in Ethiopia, right? So big difference there. Uh, so Addis Ababa has all these different um, ways of looking at it. And one of the ways that I'm interested in is how migrants have changed the physical landscape of, of the city. 
Now, I want to contrast that with some of the businesses and some of the names that are used by migrant businesses in Washington, D.C. and other places. Um, so what you, what you see here is a place that is known as Little Ethiopia. But before I go to that, um, this is what some of the businesses look like in Little Ethiopia. One of the pictures, Axum Cafe, is from um, the L.A. area. The other ones are from uh, the Washington, D.C. area. So the metropolitan Washington, D.C. area, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, or the DMV, as some of the locals call it, is home to the largest Ethiopian immigrant population in North America, perhaps the world. So this is, has a large concentration of Ethiopian migrants. It has been home to Ethiopian migrants population since at least the 1970s. And of course, the cityscape reflects this presence. Uh, there's been a lot that has been written about this. And you can see how Ethiopian migrants have inscribed themselves into the landscape. Addis Ababa restaurant, La Libella, Harar Coffee, uh, Nal restaurant, Ethiopic, Das Ethiopian, Abyssinian, Habasha, etc. Right. So the Ge'ez lettering, which is what you see here, right, the, the writing in, in um, Ge'ez in Ethiopic, um, and the colors, the green, yellow, and red colors, right, ubiquitous within this area. And you can see it. Um, remnants of like a, of an ethnic enclave. So the Ethiopian takeover of certain neighborhoods in the DMV area came in different waves. The first wave, Ethiopian businesses proliferated in the Adams Morgan neighborhood, more specifically around the 18th uh, street between Columbia and Florida Avenue, for those who know that region. In the 1980s, Ethiopian ethnic uh, entrepreneurs opened their restaurants, nightclubs, grocery stores, forming the beginning of an ethnic enclave, which would have made it the initial little Ethiopia. Uh, the vibrancy of the Ethiopian community created in once a dilapidated neighborhood was the first sign of gentrification. So the Ethiopian immigrants kind of buying up, um, uh, renting out these places preceded white migration, which led to rising rents and soaring real estate. Unfortunately, most of these businesses became a victim of their own success. The vibrancy they created attracted others um, to the once undesirable areas of Adams Morgan. Now the area is filled with luxury condos, yuppies, wine bars, trendy bunch places, smoothie joints, etc. As the rising rents pushed out the pushed the Ethiopian businesses out in the quickly gentrified Adams Morgan neighborhood, the Ethiopian businesses shifted east by the 1990s. They moved into yet another poor neighborhood with low rent and low property values and started the process once again. A new cluster formed around the 9th and U, uh, 9th Street between U and T Streets in the Shaw neighborhood. So the Shaw neighborhood started attracting a lot of Ethiopian businesses. And uh, you know, according to some, there's at least uh, 1,200 Ethiopian owned businesses within the Shaw area, uh, expanded area. And having learned from their mistakes in Adams Morgan, the Ethiopian businesses started buying up property instead of renting, um, even when it was considered to be a risky investment. So they did not see themselves as such, but uh, the ethnic Ethiopian businesses became the first gentrifiers of yet another neighborhood in Washington, DC. So when they started revitalizing the neighborhood, they started to think we need to get recognition from this. There's a precursor for this, um, another Ethiopian community in Los Angeles in 2002 got a recognition of Little Ethiopia for one of the uh, neighborhoods that they were heavily settled in. So following on this LA example, the Ethiopian immigrants in the Washington DC area started to do the same. Um, now we have to remember that ethnic neighborhood labels were not always sought after by immigrant groups. Rather places were given this names vernacularly by outsiders and it was usually seen as a pejorative and othering label denoting poverty, squalor and otherness. It is more in recent years that immigrant groups have embraced uh, such labels even going as far as to lobby city officials to get official recognition. So you get places like Little India, Koreatown, Thai Town, Little Saigon, Historic Philippi Town, or Hi-Fi, and uh, the Ethiopian community wanted to, to do the same. So why do they want this, right? On one side, it's a, a way to claim their stake within a neighborhood, right? They're saying we're here and we're here to stay. It's also to show that they've done, they were economically contributed to the place. So one of the signs that you hear, that you see here, that little Ethiopia, this is from the city of Los Angeles. 
And then um, in uh, Washington, D.C., there's a longer history in terms of how this little Ethiopia sign came to be about. Again, this is in the Shaw neighborhood. So if we want to locate the uh, little Ethiopia in, D um, in the D.C. area, it's not just in the Shaw neighborhood anymore, right? It's been spread out a little bit more. You see uh, in Arlington County and Alexandria, if you go to Silver Spring around Mon in Montgomery County, there is little pockets of um, Ethiopian settlements and businesses, uh, ethnic enclaves that have created uh, within the past couple of decades. So attempts at renaming the Shaw neighborhood as Little Ethiopia was met with significant resistance from the African-American community who have a historical claim to this area. As newcomers, Ethiopian immigrants ignored this history of the place and did not bother forging relationships with long-term African-American residents. The, re the Chile relationship meant that the Ethiopian community did not get the support of the African-American community and was therefore viewed as inappropriate, if not outright offensive. The Ethiopian community's attempts to get recognition for revitalizing the neighborhood through the ethnic businesses had been a series of missteps and has led to a sociopolitical conundrum. While the Ethiopian uh, community saw an opportunity, they were blind to the African-American historical claim to the area. And of course, African-American leaders felt slighted by this request. So what was the historical significance for African-American, right, um, for this neighborhood? So this was an area that was known as Black Broadway. This was a center for jazz clubs and restaurants. Performers such as Duke Ellington graced the stage of the local establishments. This was the place for the Black elites, right? Uh, establishments such as Howard or Lincoln Theater, um, you know, um, folks like Langston Hughes blossomed as an artist there. So it's a very historically significant place for African-American history. Um, unfortunately, the year 1968 marks the decline of the neighborhood after the assassination of Martin Luther King um, and the ensuing race riots. This area fell into disrepair, it was burned, looted, and after the 1968 race riots, it did not recover for a couple of uh, decades. So the constantation over the name of the neighborhood leads to a number of critical questions, um, notably who has the rightful claim to a neighborhood? In contested spaces such as Shaw neighborhood, this is not always an easy question to answer, right? So this is a, a case that demonstrates that ethnic labeling does not arise simply from an area's demographic composition, but it is rather a political process. Um, it can unify as well as fragment. And the tension that emerged between the Ethiopian community and the local African-American residents is a case in point. So the sign eventually did happen, right? The initial attempt was in 2000, but, um, Two years ago in 2020, the sign actually was uh, put up. So what was the background for that? So it took 16 years, right, of fighting and campaigning and building relationships between African-American community and the Ethiopian community for this to happen. Um, and this took place in the, in the middle of the Black Lives Matter movement. At this point, the Ethiopian community has settled there for more than one generation, right? Especially the second generation is more in tune with African-American history than the first generation ever was. And they started building relationships and partnerships um, across the board. And they started highlighting the, the linkages between the, the two communities, highlighting things like the, the establishment of the Abyssinian uh, Baptist Church in Harlem, Duke Ellington's travel to Ethiopia, and Ethiopia's contribution to the Pan-African movement and its effect on civil rights movement in the US. So it was done a, as a res, um, ceremonial resolution and it strikes a, a reconciliation tone and further calls attention to the sister agreement between Addis Ababa and Washington DC, where there is a location in Addis Ababa named Washington DC Square, right? So you can see the back and forth in between. So um, this is a very interesting um, relationship building that happened between two different communities. So what is my main argument here? Um, I'm arguing that migration is inscribed in specific geographies, right? But those geographies are not blank slates. Those geographies come imbued with their own histories. Um, so there's a lot of contestation that can happen around that. So I'll end here and then um, pass it on to, to the next presenter. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Girwan. Um, yeah, lots of resonances there with Tashari's paper. Um, I'm interested interested to uh, flesh out some of those connections. But first, uh, let's move on to um, Dr. David Ahrens, 
who is an ethnomusicologist here at the in the School of Music at UNCG. So, Dr. Ahrens. Your microphone's still off. Here we go. Jeez. <laughs> Just couldn't find it. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> my presentation here i'm looking at um rastafari in ethiopia i'm thinking about amplification spirituality space making and the politics of being heard in ethiopia so there are some connections between this and dr german's presentation and her research for sure um i'm already seeing connections happening i'm focusing more on people who've moved into ethiopia and i'm thinking about space making not so much in terms of landscapes um, as you've heard before, but soundscapes. I'm trying to think through sound. Um, I'm thinking through the possibilities and limitations of sonic space making. I'm gonna have to give some background first before I get into the detail details. So the Rastafari movement started in Jamaica in about the 1930s, but it was coming out of a larger um, movement of back to Africa, um, Pan-Africanism, informed by a lot of Marcus Garvey's teachings and writings and speeches about the need for Africans to come together, but also for a lot of Africans to, or descendants of Africans to move to Africa. It's also informed by Ethiopianism, which I understand it as a, a reservoir of um, knowledge and symbols that Black people in the West used um, for strength and inspiration to fight against colonialism, oppression, racism. And so the Rastafari movement comes out of a lot of that. Allegedly, at one point, Marcus Garvey said, look to the East for there shall be a black king crowned. And so Jamaicans, black Jamaicans who were fighting against the system, who were, um, had a strong anti-colonial orientation, they took this as prophecy that um, a black king was going to come up in the East and that would be the Messiah. And so shortly after, Rastafari Makonnen of Ethiopia was crowned Haile Selassie, King of Kings, um, conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. Um, it's a long title, I can't remember the rest of it right now. And so this group of people took the name um, Rastafari and call it Rastafari. So they worship or they believe Haile Selassie to be an important figure. And even the name of the movement Rastafari is coming out of his um, original name and title, Ras Tafari. So this gained steam in about the 1930s in Jamaica. And um, many people know about Rastafari through reggae music, for instance, Bob Marley was a major person. And so music has always from the get-go played a major role in amplifying Rastafari, amplifying the beliefs of Rastafari or the levity. Levity means their way of life. So in a nutshell, that's one of it. Um, some of the tenets of Rastafari, which is kind of important here. Um, so Rastafari mostly believe that Haile Selassie is either God himself or a human manifestation of God. There are different beliefs about the exact nature of Haile Selassie and his relationship to the divine, but he's always connected to the divine, no matter which um, Rastafari group or organization you're talking about. So there's a belief in Haile Selassie as a really important spiritual divine figure. Um, a desire to connect with Africans, so African unity is important. Marijuana, the use of marijuana as a sacred sacrament is important. And also repatriation. This is one of the major things that Rastafari believe that they should go back to Africa and live. And for a lot of Rastafari, Ethiopia is the number one spot, um, particularly because Ethiopia resisted colonialism. Ethiopia is mentioned in the Bible. Um, and, and Haile Selassie, who was this figure, um, this kind of a symbol, this father of Africa, who helped to initiate the African Union, for instance. Um, he's Ethiopian as well. There's also other things like Ethiopia's longstanding history of Christianity and spirituality that's documented. Um, so lots of reasons why Rastafari looked to Ethiopia in many ways as a promised land. Now in the 1930s, uh, Mussolini in invaded Ethiopia 
And um, so Italy occupied Ethiopia for a short time. And at this point, Haile Selassie was able to get people in the West um, on his side. You know, he was getting especially black people um, to support Ethiopia's war against Italy. And so the Ethiopian World Federation was founded in the 1930s. And so there were different chapters all over the Americas. Um, there was one in Jamaica as well. It was mainly just to, to, to galvanize support for Ethiopia. But after the war ended and Italy left, um, or were Italy, they were driven out, Haile Selassie granted land in Ethiopia for anybody, any black person in the West who wanted to make Ethiopia their home. So it was really a land grant for anybody, any black person who wanted to come to Ethiopia. And while some people took it up, it wasn't until the 1960s when Rastafari in Jamaica heard about it that they took it up in, in major numbers. So the majority of people who moved to Ethiopia believing it to be their promised land were Rastafari. This was more in the 1960s. Um, they moved to a small place or a town at the time, it was a really small town called Shashamani, which is what I'm really, the place I'm really talking about here today. Um, and they've had many issues since then, and this is important. You know, they believe Ethiopia is their promised land, that Haile Selassie granted them land was like, this is, this is showing that the prophecy is real, that he is the king, that Ethiopia is a promised land, and that he's calling them to return. So people started to move there, but then shortly after, in the early 1970s, there was a coup and Haile Selassie was removed from power. A new government took over and they nationalized all land. So the government owns land. You can own, you can own your, your, your structure on the land, but you don't actually own the land. And the original land grant that was offered by Haile Selassie just became um, null and void, essentially. So Rastafari ended up in a precarious situation where um, well, for many of them, they were stateless because they had no documents. There was no policy in place to acknowledge them as um, migrants or returnees is the, the phrase that they prefer, returnees or repatriates. And um, th so there are things that they can't do. They don't have a clear access to citizenship, which is what they want because they believe that they're you know, Ethiopian. Um, They've had trouble accessing things like healthcare, education, jobs, because they're not in the system. And so since the 1960s up until now, there are lots of issues there. They also, um, that they have believed that, that Ethiopia is their home and their promised land, but there are many cultural differences between um, the Rastafari who've moved there, whether they've come from the Caribbean, from North America, or from Europe. Um, and Ethiopians, right? So they're having difficulty, language, for instance, culture. So they're having a hard time like um, connecting with Ethiopians in many ways. Shashamane is the town where Rastafari have mostly settled. It's south of Addis Ababa. It's about 250 kilometers south. Um, originally, I mean, when they first moved there, there was no electricity. It was really small, but it's now quite built up. Um, recent estimates were about like over 200,000 people living in Shashamani. Um, in the area is a small section just before the main town, and that's where Rastafari have settled. It's technically called Melka Oda, and it's tens of thousands of people live there. The Rastafari community is maybe just about 500 to 800 people. Really, really small population of repatriated Rastafari. However, if you go to Google Maps and look at that area, it's actually labeled Jamaican, Jamaica Safar, which and Safar is like a village or town or community and area. So on Google Maps, it's labeled as Jamaica Safar. So it shows the impact that Rastafari have had. It is kind of similar to what Haywan was talking about with like little Ethiopia in DC, what it means when a migrant community gets you know, their own name. And Rastafari, I feel pretty proud of this. Um, so I'm thinking about space making, how Rastafari are in this town and demonstrating that they belong there. They believe that they've gotten a land grant and they have every right to be there. However, it's a contested space, of course. People were living there before they came in. Um, it's in the Oromia region, um, which one of the largest regions or one of, um, of the largest ethnic group in Ethiopia, the Oromo, who have been historically um, marginalized by the state, and it, this depends on who you talk to. Um, and so there's some issues 
with Rastafari being in this region, in this town, with a lot of Oromo people um, who don't like Haile Selassie. Many of them really see Haile Selassie as a dictator, as an oppressor. And here we have in this town, a group of people who constantly worship Haile Selassie. So I'm thinking about space making in different ways. Here they are in this community, the Rastafari. And as you can see, you can see this all over on the main road, um, the red, green, and gold, which is Ethiopian flag. Um, and they have the um, Moambesa, the Lion of Judah symbol, which is a symbol of the monarchy. Um, Rastafari uses as a symbol of Haile Selassie as well, because that was the last time that flag was used. It's only really Rastafari who get away with using this symbol. It's um, the current government, there's a new flag of Ethiopia that does not include this, this flag. And so if you're using this flag, then it's like you are siding with the monarchy instead of the current political state. So it's, it's seen as a problem. Um, but Rastafari make themselves known by their symbols in Ethiopia, specifically in Shashamani. Um, so, this is part of a larger project. So I'm just going to read a little bit of some of what I'm thinking through here, instead of getting into everything. So in Ethiopia, Rastafari, I want to be seen, heard, understood, and accepted as a spiritual community, as a community that loves Ethiopia and values Pan-African solidarity. And I'm looking at how they use sound as one space-making strategy to achieve some of these goals, right? And in terms of space making, I'm thinking of how people inhabit or move through space and how they transform space into an environment that serves their needs and also um, represents who they are. So space really participates in a whole kind of identity building processes, but also community building. And it's important um, because space making is connected to identity formation, who, even at the individual level, who I am, and, and where I inhabit, what the place around me looks like, what it feels like, what it sounds like. And so asserting your individual identity is definitely connected to what you are seeing and hearing around you as well. Um, so while their sonic space making strategies announce their presence on the land and amplify their spirituality, Rastafari face obstacles in being heard as a spiritual community because of their practice of, of worshiping Emperor Haile Selassie and their use of sound systems. I'll talk about that later. So even though they're being heard, they're not often understood in the way that they want to be understood. So there's something about being heard, but also about being um, understood, you know? This presentation is part of a larger project in which I argue that for repatriated Rastafari, the application of their spirituality in different venues not only functions as a form of space making that builds community and facilitates interaction with Ethiopians, but also potentially exacerbates tensions between Rastafari and Ethiopia in Shashamani, because they're challenging established conceptions of spirituality, place, and space. Shashamani means different things to different people. I mean, and we can talk about it in different ways, geography, the rivers, the landscape, um, but it's also a crossroads town. It's a place where people might have lived, can trace their ancestry, you know, um, for, for 100 years or so. So it means different things to different people. Rastafari have moved there and declared it to be the holy promised land that was given to them by Haile Selassie, especially considering that there are people on that land who don't like Haile Selassie. So Rastafari, just by being there, they're challenging conceptions of space. And I argue that they're using sound to do that as well. And in some ways, perhaps it's helpful and in some ways um, it, it can also be problematic for them. So I'm just going to go through a few examples of some of the sounds that you might hear in Shashamani and just think through um, how they're using sound as a space-making strategy, as I'm trying to think through the connections between sound and space-making, also amplification. So when I got to Ethiopia and I went to Shashamani and I stayed there for the first time, I stayed with a Rastafari who was originally from Trinidad and Tobago. His name is Ras Quintasab. I stayed in a little um, chikabet, which is a small mud hut on his property. And in the morning, I remember waking up, hearing all these nice birds. And then I heard this, this piercing wail of a sound. It scared me, I didn't know what it was. Only to find out that it was Ras Quintasab himself standing up outside in his yard, chanting out the name of Haile Selassie. Then I heard another a neighbor actually respond and chant a similar neighbor, a, a similar chant. Um, 
And I've heard that that was, after talking to him, he said it's like a wake up call for the area, you know, because the Muslims have their call to prayer, the Orthodox Christian churches have their chants on loudspeakers as well. So we as Rastafari should have our own chants. And so this is one of the ways that at the very, you know, small local level in the neighborhood, different Rastafari are asserting their presence using sound, but doing it in a way that is potentially um, understandable by Ethiopians because in Shashamani, as many places in Ethiopia, you can hear um, chants coming from Orthodox churches and, and mosques calling you to prayer. And so in this way, some Rastafari are trying to use a similar approach to announce not only that they're on the land, but they're also a spiritual community. Somebody did a documentary, um, Mahalet, I can't remember her last name, um, and she actually captured video of Ras Quintasab doing this chant. I never did because I felt uncomfortable asking him, but then she asked him on video and, and he did it and now it's available on YouTube. So you can kind of get a sense of what it sounds like in his yard, in his neck of the neighborhood. Okay. There's also somebody narrating in between, um, another Rastafari, but you get to hear Ras Quintasab chant. Many of us come here with just what we have on our back because of the promise of a better tomorrow, not necessarily today have to be so much better. And our initiative is to work hard for that better tomorrow. And job blesses us. So we get jobs, we get housing, we get those things here in Ethiopia, even when the system was before the government's new decree was against us. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Declaring this home and, and settling down and staying here past our three month or six month or two year visa. You know what I'm saying? Many Rastas just come and said, you know, forget the visa, I'm staying. This is my home. Right, so he's saying Jai Rastafari, Haley Selassie, Haley I Selassie, Haile Selassie is what he's saying. So he's chanting this, and then the neighbors will also join in. Not all the neighbors, but some. Um, I spoke to an Oromo scholar. So the Oromo is the largest ethnic group in Ethiopia, Dr. Gemachu Mergesa. Um, Magersa, Dr. Gemachu Magersa. And he was saying, you know, this is potentially dangerous. If people know that he's chanting Haile Selassie's name in an area where lots of Aroma are, they might not like this at all. And this might exacerbate some of the tensions experienced between Rastafari and Oromo um, and their Oromo neighbors because of the disdain for Haile Selassie that a lot of Oromo people have. So on one hand, this is something that's is he's inserting himself into the soundscapes in a way that might be understandable as spiritual because of the chant nature, but also the issue is that he's using Haile Selassie's name. Right, so there are limitations to how you can transform space. Um, are you contributing to the spiritual nature of um, Shashamani, or are you disrupting the spirituality by 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 sending something like this? No, I'm doing for time. There are other there are other sounds that Rastafari do, such as Nayabingi drumming. That's a whole different kind of tradition where they're actually using drums and chanting. And it's similar to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church in that no electronic instruments are used and the tabernacles themselves are built in a circular um, circular kind of a structure. So there are connections between Rastafari worship and Ethiopia. The difference is that um, Rastafari in this space are praising Haile Selassie, which um, they're, so they're, 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 they're putting out these sounds of praise to Haile Selassie. I don't have any recordings of this. They asked me not to record. Um, but the, I do have this recording that it's, it's very difficult to hear unless you have earphones, but I do want to at least play it to think about soundscapes and what and how Rastafari engage with it. This is something I recorded when I was in Shashamani and it was just in Ras Quintasab's house and I could hear the call to prayer from the mosque, but I could also hear the drums and the Nyabingi chants from the Nyabingi tabernacle at the same time. And then there are all these birds as well. So you're getting 
um, the way that spirituality enters the, the soundscape, you're getting um, sounds from the mosques and the sounds from Rastafari. You probably won't hear much of this unless you have speakers, but I, I still am going to play it because I think recording sounds is a, is a methodology um, to understand how humans create space um, and how it interacts with nature as well. So you might have been able to hear the, the call to prayer, somebody's chanting, and in the very background, you can hear doom, 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 drumming. That's coming from the Rastafari tabernacle. It's all kind of coming together, but they're distinct, they're distinct things. I think I should kind of wrap up here because um, I want to get a chance for questions and answers. Just the, maybe the final thing is that even louder than some of these chants are the Rastafari sound system dances. And so these are the huge speakers that's a big part of Jamaican dance hall culture where music is played really loud on sound systems. And so Rastafari have brought these speakers into Chashamani, a quiet kind of sleepy tone. And on some nights in this um, Jamaica Sefer, this area where the Rastafari are, this is the loudest thing that you will hear because nobody else has equipment like this. Um, and on one hand, it allows people to know that the Rastafari are there, like it announces their presence, but at the same time, um, non-Rastafari don't necessarily get a sense that this is um, spirituality, right? Because it sounds like popular music. That's a whole other co conversation to be had. Um, but even, so it, even though it's really loud, it also um, takes away from the spirituality in the ears of non-Rastafari. All right, so let me just leave it there. Um, I don't never have any conclusion. I have some closing thoughts, but I'll just leave it so that we can get into questions and things like that. Thank you so much, David. Really interesting. Yes, there's definitely connections and threads between these three papers. Maybe um, now, if we just want to sort of open it up for the panel to sort of comment on each other's papers, and in the meantime, all you attendees out there, if you'd like to, if you have a question, please drop one in the chat and I will uh, uh, officiate and bring that to the group. But anybody have comments on their colleagues' work here? Um, so I just wanted to say a quick thing about um, David's presentation, like the when you played that. Um, sound of uh, the gentleman kind of singing Haile Selassie's name. Um, like I really can visualize and picture how like in Ethiopian uh, spaces on one side, you have the Muslim, uh, the mosques calling for prayer. On the other side, you have the Orthodox churches with, you know, the Kandasi, which is a very unique form of like, uh, you know, it's very musical on both sides. And then you have this a uh, new group that is coming in and adapting to what already exists, but, you know, like making their mark on it at the same time. Um, that was very visually and um, I guess audiovisually very powerful for me. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I left a comment in the chat when I saw those speakers, my eyes lit up because my both my grandparents, they used to, um, have uh events and block parties where they would set up those speakers <laughs> the same exact speakers <laughs> yeah they're loud i was really struck with the progression of of your three presentations in particular i, I wonder if either of you would want to comment on the temporality of space making so Tashara, you talk of six, spa six spaces and healthy spaces as sort of long standing, you know, um, sentiments upon these places. And Haywan, you then talk more about migratory spaces that might have a, an essence or a, are around them for like a generation and then move around, which is a very different sort of uh, impression upon a space. And David, you're working in sound that is really ephemeral. So you have to re keep doing it again and again in order to keep making the space. Um, so there was a really interesting 
um, difference in the way you you sort of dealt with time and placemaking over a period of time. And I wonder if you had any comments on that. Or Tishari, how, how do you make, say, a sick space healthy again? That is a good question, and I don't have an answer yet. <laughs> It's something that I definitely uh, want to explore more. Uh, I haven't been able to working on my dissertation, but that's something like that I think could be another project. Um, and I've gotten some feedback from my interview participants on, you know, just asking them, well, how could, what would galvanize you to participate in these spaces? And um, some of them say, you know, acknowledging the past. Some of them say there needs to be more visual representation. So like even seeing um, David's uh, presentation and how you have people in nature and, and, you know, singing and stuff like that spirituality kind of thing. And um, just in those kind of spaces, just more visual res representation, community engagement, those kinds of things. Um, but I think also telling stories of people is very important and shifting the narrative, as I mentioned, and showing people that there are Black people who do this, not just in the United States, but across the world and internationally. Um, I've talked, well, I've talked about it before. You weren't privy to the conversation, but talking about Caribbean people and how they practice, uh, they have green practices in their countries and how that's not really acknowledged and people in various countries in Africa are doing so many sustainability related projects that don't really get acknowledged. So kind of showcasing that as well, addressing the past and then showing what's happening now um, and you know, bringing light to all of those things, just kind of removing that veil, I guess. Um, so building on what Tashari said, I think one of the links between all of our presentation is this idea of inclusion and exclusion, right? Places where uh, Black folks are allowed or not allowed, uh, how Black folks interact with one another, right? Because there's a diversity in terms of what Blackness represents and how to claim a stake in that particular space. Um, and people do it through a lot of different ways, right? It might be in nature, it might be through migration, it might be through sound or spirituality. Um, but I, like, I, I really like that thread that kind of links all the three different presentations together. Um, for me, one of the things uh, within migration that really strikes me is how uh, we think of these geographic spaces as separate, right? We think about, you know, the city of Addis Ababa, which is kind of, you know, so far away, um, and uh, Washington DC, but there's so much in conversation um, as capital cities, as cities that have, that we uh, that yield very significant political power in their own spheres, as places where you, this one migrant group kind of inscribes themselves in different ways, right? I really like how uh, you can physically see migration on the different spaces, right? Like it's, you can't miss it when you go into certain places. I mean, here, I only represented the visual aspect, but that's not the only thing. The way David talked about sound, we can also talk about smell, right? Like the, the different cuisines, all the smells that come from the restaurants. When you walk down the street, you, you know you're in a different space just through, through the smell. And of course, the languages that are spoken in those areas. So these are different ways that people mark their presence in a particular place. And you know, exclusion can come from um, racial discord, ethnic differences. And I think for Ethiopian migrants, one of the things that is important to talk about is which names are represented, which identities has represented, what is represented as Ethiopian, right? Because as uh, David alluded, yet you have the, the Oromo group that does not necessarily support some of the ideas of the imperialist um, uh, history of the country. And these are not the names that are represented in spaces like Washington, DC. Like you, I've not, I haven't seen up to now, like an Oromo restaurant, for instance. I've heard of a few in, in the Minnesota, Minnesota area, but I haven't seen one. Um, and considering that Ethiopia has 80 different ethnic groups, right? You still have the very unique names of Abyssinia that comes up over and over again, kind of alluding to this imperial history. 
So even in these spaces, what is included and what is excluded by these migrants, uh, I think is important to, to talk about. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad to hear these different connections. I mean, even Gavin, we're talking about temporality. And I see that in all of, all of what we're doing here. And what it also shows is how space making is a process. And so, you know, it, it has to be done over and over. People have to be doing something over and over for spaces to take on meaning or social significance or for spaces to impact people. It's just kind of going over and over. And, you know, whether we're looking at how people are challenging an idea of space or, you know, as Tashari was looking at how spaces become to mean something over time, like, like that was very detailed, like a long process by which green spaces in the South take on a certain kind of meaning. Um, but then there's hope because it's a process and it means that can be challenged as well. Um, so that's something. And so one thing Heyon was just saying about exclusion and inclusion, what's interesting about space making too is power, power dynamics. Who are the people there? Who are the people in control of how spaces are sensed, how spaces are created and who gets to challenge that? Um, there's always a politics involved there, politics of belonging, politics of being heard, politics of being seen, recognized, understood. Um, so I think that, yeah, I mean, thinking about all these different things, the ways that are connected, um, this has been lovely. The, the multi-sensory piece is really interesting. You know, how do you make a safe, a place safe when the very act of making that space might be a dangerous act or might incur some, um, and then who polices the sound, who polices the sense or the restaurants or the, the monuments or, you know, uh, whatever these things that make up the, the space. And, how, and the way you push back against sound regulations is a little different than how you might push back against restaurant regulations or, you know, whatever. Um, there's many sensory uh, things at work here. Um, any comments from people out there in the, uh, in the ether? I'm, I'm yelling a little louder as if you'll hear me better. <laughs> Uh, I'm still trying to make sense of this this space that we've been in for two years. Any final comments from our panelists? I loved how you refer to this virtual space that we're in right now, <laughs> because that makes a, a big difference as well, right? Like having the, the audience in front of us to be able to actually see facial uh, reactions. And uh, unfortunately, we're not able to do that. Um, but I'm assuming everyone where they are is, um, you know, engaged in this conversation together with us. But just wanted to make a quick comment about Tashari's presentation, where uh, you talked about Harriet Tubman, and we think of her in a very specific role as part of the Underground Railroad, but we never think about her as like a nature, um, forgot the word that you used. <laughs> explorer, exp expeditionist. <laughs> yes, an explorer, expeditionist. I think that's a really interesting way to kind of think about that uh, because of the spaces that she was in, because of how she was going about actually, you know, uh, providing like a uh, routes and freedom for, for people that were enslaved. And it also made me think about um, the coastal areas, the Gula Geechee areas, where those nature spaces served as a refuge mm -hmm. uh, for slavery and how that space that was a refuge is now being taken away because it's beach resorts, right? It's beach towns, beautiful mm -hmm. areas, et cetera, and how spaces can change in terms of their definition over time. So. Um, just wanted to say that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I can I. There was something that that yeah. talked, I know we're like at time, but for Tashari, it's something I'm thinking about. But Tashari and Hewan too. Um, that the media is important at some point. Um, how do how, and how the media shapes the idea of spaces and who belongs and and all of that. Like, you know what does it mean to like not see black people in nature in music videos or, or, or TV shows? Um, and even like in DC, what, is, what how are Ethiopians represented in the media in Ethiopia? Like how does that shape conceptions of space as well? And who, again, were the people pulling the strings? Were the people behind that? Um, how much agency do people have um, if they might be, if they want to be represented in a positive light? Um, 
how much agency do they have? You know, mm-hmm. I just I think thinking about the media um, could be something interesting if we wanted to take this into a longer conversation, but maybe we don't have the time. Right. But I, I just, I'm just interested in that. I surely, truly wish we did have a longer time. This has been really, really interesting. Um, thank you all for um, participating. Um, Tashari, Haywan, and David, I really enjoyed what you had to say. I think we all really enjoyed what you had to say. Um, and a couple of thank yous appearing in the, uh, the chat there. So with that, we will uh, end this session. There are still plenty other uh, um, space making, black space making opportunities on Zoom for you for the next, uh, for the rest of the conference. So thank you all for uh, your participation.